store for over 20 years uh, doing uh, consultations relatively uh, once a month, just about for, before I even moved to California. Great podiatrist, lectures around the world on uh, biomechanics and, and foot ailments, etc. And so we're, we're really lucky to have him. Really appreciate him being here. Top is obvious. Um, how many people here, real quick, how many people here are running in Vibram or something very, very minimal or barefoot? So about half the crowd. And the other half is curious. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, without further ado, Dr. Kirby. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you for uh, having me out here, Pat. Uh, you know, I just want to say a little word about my relationship with Flea Feed. And, um, you know, Pat's actually kind of a late cop here. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I grew up in Sacramento. So I ran from a class GI. I actually, when Sally Edwards and Liz Jansen first opened Flea Feed, they were uh, in that Victorian across mm -hmm. the street, the very first fleet they ever made. Mm -hmm. I was a, at ending my senior year, starting my freshman year at UC Davis on the Aggies. So, uh, you know, I ran the Boston Marathon with Sally and Liz and the group back in 1979. So, and then, you know, I got and came back here to practice in 1985 after doing my, my training. Uh, you know, I set up a relationship with uh, Sally when she was over there, and then eventually Pat, who's a great owner, uh, and Tom Rayner, who owns the group now, is uh, it's a great store for a lot of people here, and a lot of dietists are for people here at Fleafy. So I, I uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, even though I, I do podiatry, I really, uh, I was a runner. Uh, way before I was a podiatrist, I ran, uh, I went to Hollywood Park Elementary School, ran fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Walking Miller Junior High, which is not even in existence now, ran track cross country, the Clatchy High. I ran cross country track. I ran my first marathon at age 17. I ran a 239 marathon at age 18 in my senior year of high school. You know, I ran uh, for the Aggies at UC Davis for four years. And uh, you know, I ran a, well, I've run a 228 marathon. That was back when I had more hair and muscles. I'll show you a picture of me when I actually was really fast. So, uh, you know, I'm coming from just not just from a sports podiatrist, but as uh, someone who was a competitive runner at one time. And uh, I just want to give you my impression of the barefoot running movement. And uh, especially, I want to go through the scientific evidence. Because I think when you go on the internet and you hear people talk, especially if people have a financial interest behind the barefoot running or minimalist shoe craze, uh, you tend to get a lot of misinformation. So that's one of the things I'm going to try to. Uh, say is what does the science say, uh, what's the evidence, and uh, I'm going to try to bring the, the research, for, I'm sure those of you, many of you have non-medical backgrounds, I'm going to try to bring it down to a level where you guys can understand where we are in our knowledge and where we need to go from there. So when we start looking at the history of running, we start seeing that we have to understand why do we run. <coughs> and running was an essential activity for our ancestors. Uh, we would run for uh, hunting for food. We would run to escape dangerous animals. Uh, we may have run to the nearby community as a messenger. So the ability to run for our ancient ancestors was very helpful. And it was probably helpful for the survival of our ancestors. In ancient culture, when we started looking at the earliest races that were held uh, in, in recorded history, we saw that the uh, the Olympics that were held in 776 BC, they were held every four years in Olympia. And uh, that, this track here is actually the site of one of the uh, tracks that was, they had the first races. Then there used to be the old Olympics with just one race. And this was a race that was a two stade race, 384 meters. So one of the questions becomes when you start looking at the idea that barefoot running is good or bad is if were man's ancestors really barefoot runners? Well, when we start looking at the ancient Greek vases from over 2,500 years ago, there is depiction of men running, and these are pretty realistic pictures of, of the running form, and they are barefoot. So we know that probably the early ancestors, at least uh, two, uh, 2,500 years ago, were running barefoot because this is the way they were depicted on these ancient vases. Another question comes, there's a concern that we as um, runners have lived so many years barefoot and so many generations barefoot that we just recently in shoes. Well, how old are shoes? 
Well, the first, the oldest shoe in existence was actually found in 1938. It was actually found in a cave in Oregon. This has been a radiocarbon dated to 8,000 BC. It's made of woven sagebrush. They, and if you guys go on the internet, you can, I got all these pictures off the internet. It's amazing how well the shoe was constructed as of, this is 10,000 years ago. So 10,000 years is about 5,000 generations of people who could have been running and walking in these shoes. The oldest leather shoe was found in Armenia back uh, to, dated back to 3500 BC. These were actually a size seven women's uh, shoe, and they're actually a very nice construction done of a leather hide with, uh, with uh, the laces across the uh, top here. And this uh, is an interesting find. Now you gotta understand that the old shoes weren't made of rubber. They were, had to be plant materials, or they had to be animal materials. So this is the, the shoe dating before that, they're probably gone. The shoes have been dissolved by the environment. One interesting study, Eric Trink Trinkhaus, he's actually done his PhD on trying to figure out how old or how long ago did people wear shoes. And his archaeological evidence suggests that as late as 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, people were wearing shoes from looking at the shape of the digits that they're in. So to say that uh, we wore shoes just recently is probably false. We've seen maybe that maybe 20,000 generations of uh, humans have been wearing shoes. So there is some suggestion that even our ancient ancestors, if we consider 40,000 years ancient, are, are, were shoe wearers. Now, what happens when you take a population that is barefoot versus a population that's shot? And this is an interest, and obviously here, we're not going to find this here in California, but you can go to some other islands where you have shod people versus barefoot people. And what they find is that, in the one study that I found on this, is that the uh, barefoot subject had not only wider feet, but also had lower plantar pressures. And what a plantar pressure is, is actually the force over surface area. Pressure is like a stress. And so they take the force divided over surface area, that's going to be a pressure. And that's going to be how hard that bottom of the foot hits. And they think that the people were barefoot and lower pressures because their feet were typically broader and flatter in the arch than the people that were and had more fleshy feet. So that would put the body weight over a larger surface area, which decreased the pressure. Okay, this brings us to Crispy Google and Born to Run. I'm sure now, how many people have not read Born to Run? Well, that's about half. Okay, so I'm assuming the other half have read that. Now, uh, Chris McDougall is given credit with uh, sparking this quote-unquote barefoot running revolution. Uh, he's, uh, he writes a good book, this book, Born to Run. He talks about this, it uh, chronicles this Terrahomera Indians from the Copper Canyons of Mexico. And uh, Mr. McDougall talks about how great these endurance running uh, Indians are. And he also speculates in the book that this modern cushion running shoe that we sell here at the running shoe stores and is been around for the last 30 years, he thinks is the cause of many of the injuries. And he suggests that maybe we should be running barefoot like our ancestors or running in the minimalist type shoes. One of the funny things about Chris McDougall, of course Chris here is not running barefoot or in minimalist fiber shoes, but he's wearing a thick sole shoe, uh, which is kind of interesting. But um, he, uh, he uh, doesn't like me for some reason. Uh, his quote out of his blog says, anyone who runs without shoes is constantly asked about all that dangerous glass out there. Take this comment from Kevin Kirby, the angry podiatrist. <laughs> now, do I look angry to you? So, uh, and he, he doesn't like me because I've actually commented publicly on the internet and various magazine and books about how I think his book is uh, not an accurate representation of reality. But anyway, so let's go, and this, so this is a little bit of the history, kind of a fun thing for me, because here I'm a runner, grew up here in Sacramento, I've been running all my life, and I've uh, been called an angry podiatrist. Now my kids love that, because I, I got a 28-year-old and a 22-year-old, <laughs> I told them that, they just almost fell on the floor now. Angry podiatrist, dad, that's great, I'm going to fight that from now on. So uh, let's look at the famous barefoot runners. The, probably the most famous barefoot runner of all is a baby of Keaton. Why? Because this guy won the 1960 World Marathon while barefoot. His time was 2.15.16. The story was he got there, they didn't have the right size shoe, he had been training barefoot all along, he ran the race barefoot wandering. So that's a pretty amazing thing. Now, that was 50 years ago. What's interesting though, more further, when you start looking at the difference of shoes versus barefoot, <laughs> is that four years later, 
he broke his record. He actually ran seven seconds faster per mile, but he wore shoes. So Baby Bakigo had actually, you could say, got faster when he wore shoes, of course he wore bare. So that's a little fact of history, and you guys can check the times. There are seven seconds per mile faster when he wore shoes. So the other thing that's interesting is that a uh, since a Baby Bakigo's marathon win in this international marathon, there's not been a single athlete who's won a major international marathon over 50 years barefoot, running the whole thing. Zola Bud. Zola Bud is, for those of you who uh, have uh, lost some hair like I have, mm -hmm. remember Zola Bud. She was a phenomenal uh, distance runner from South Africa. She ran in 1984, uh, broke the 5,000 meter record. She, unfortunately, for poor girls, she uh, collided with Mary Decker during the 1984 Olympic 3,000 meter race. Decker was taken out of the race. Uh, Zola Bud was blamed for it, even though she probably was an accident. And what's interesting about a quote now is that, in a, as an older woman, she says, I no longer run barefoot as I got older because I had injuries to my hamstring. I found that wearing shoes gives me more support and protection from injury. So obviously running barefoot is something that some of the athletes, elite athletes can do, but these are two, and there's other elite athletes that have done so, but these are the two most marked. <coughs> now, we start to talk about this idea of the minimalist shoe, and this is a, uh, just has started in the last two or three years. This is a shoe that is gonna either have a lower heel height, but it's also going to be a thinner sole shoe. Now, obviously, the part of the classic minimalist shoe that they then sell here at Flea Feet is the Vibram Fly Finger. This Vibram Fly Finger shoe, Vibram is an Italian company, and they actually, the story was they actually designed this shoe to be uh, used as a yacht or boat shoe because they could grip the surface of the uh, uh, boat, they have their toes out, and then, you know, it's kind of a cool shoe to walk around. I've walked around around these things, but they're saying, well, this is a good alternative for people who can't really run barefoot because it's too hard out there, so let's try the Vibram. Vibram is, I think, on the Amazon now, number seven selling shoe on Amazon. Incredible. So the, the, this shoe has just exploded in popularity. Well, the, when you start looking at the Vibram Five Finger website, and I'm sorry to show you this, this picture here. It's, uh, this is straight from the Vibram website. They, they're really into good marketing. What's in now, you've got to pay attention. I've got to pay attention. Look at their feet. They're mm -hmm. wearing Vibrams. They're wearing Vibrams. This is their marketing for their shoes, and we should be natural, and they have these naked people on the website, and it's right on there. You can click on the woman's leg here and zoom right into it if you want to, for those who like to do that sort of thing. Or the man. <laughs> <laughs> so when you guys can do that, I'm just showing you. Go on and type in, uh, I think it's Barefoot Technology or something like that. This is all from the internet. What's funny about the Vibram Five Finger, what's not what's funny for the people wearing it, we've seen a rise in incidents in metacarpal stress fractures. In fact, this is taken from the Runner's World Forum, the 729 2010. This guy named Downtown Runner, he says this uh, can walk through for his stress fracture is what he calls his current minimalist footwear. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's obviously, it, it, these shoes are okay for some people, but some people get injured, and this is, this is kind of what I'm trying to do, is trying to show you the, the approach that we look at as sports podiatrists and why we recommend certain shoes versus others. Well, another idea is, are these minimal shoes really a new idea? I mean, if you look at the barefoot web pages, they say, oh, these minimal shoes, those Nike and, and, and uh, Asics, they're all out to get us because they're making thick sole shoes trying injuries. Well, are these minimal shoes really something new? Pat and I both ran a lot back in the 70s, and we know what the shoes were like.